Well, good, 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 good evening, everybody. Um, um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are meeting and pay my respects to elders past and present. So welcome to the 28th of September Central Coast Council Ordinary Meeting. I will now declare the meeting open. And in line with the public health orders and the stay at home requirements, we've had a significant impact on how we work and function in daily lives. Until such time that requirements are lifted, council will be held, held. The public can attend by way of webcast. Tonight's meeting will look different to our viewers at home. To attend, just to just to We have uh, uh, Team, team of, of monthly, and we're in the safe, safe environments. Operating council meetings can pose challenges, and I may um, make that uh, uh, during the meeting, but the chat, 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 chat. It is a changing way of working for us, so thank you for your, for your we may, we may experience some technical issues to navigate our work this evening's uh and if we do i ask that you be please be patient with us i think we have an echo at the moment so hopefully that will be fixed shortly just to remind people that this meeting is being webcast i remind those participating in the meeting via zoom that your image and what you say will be recorded and broadcast live to the public so please be mindful of this you should make avoid making statements that might defame or offend and i note that council will not be responsible for your actions Please close any other programs on your devices as they can interfere with the sound. I'm just now going to make a few comments before we move into the meeting proper. Firstly, COVID, and as of yesterday, our outdoor pools have reopened and teams across all of our facilities and venues are preparing to reopen in the coming weeks following the New South Wales government's announcement of a roadmap to getting out of lockdown. And this is based around reaching the 70% double dose vaccination target. Council continues to support the advice issued by the New South Wales government. And the best thing you can do to protect yourself and those you care about is to stay home, stay safe and get vaccinated. The New South Wales government has announced a roadmap to getting out of lockdown. As I said, about reaching that 70% and 80% double dose vaccination. So there is light at the end of the tunnel. The latest evening of easing of restrictions for fully vaccinated adults who live outside Sydney's LGAs of concern allows for groups of up to five people to gather for outdoor recreation like picnics and exercise. That limit does not include kids under the age of 12. All adults in those groups need to be able to show proof that they are double vaccinated. So as restrictions ease, Council plans to commence a staged full-time return to service. This will be done in a considered and planned way and will be governed by the public health order. It is important to know that this will be staged, happen in a staged way and more understanding is required in relation to the new South Wales uh, government's roadmap before decisions can be made. Unfortunately, new COVID case numbers continue to increase here on the coast, a further 29 today. Exposure sites are on the rise and it is vitally important that everybody does their part and helping to control the outbreak of the Delta COVID-19 variant. All confirmed exposure sites are listed on the New South Wales Health Case uh, Locations webpage. New South Wales Health is the responsible agency who can provide the most timely and up-to-date advice. I implore the community to remain diligent when moving about. If you need to leave home, mask up, check in and keep your distance as it's community health is everybody's responsibility. So please keep yourself and our community safe. Uh, Council's now continuing to still deliver our interrupted essential waste collections, resource recovery and disposal service to our community, all with safe proto uh, COVID protocols in place. One little somewhat bit of good news, although perhaps uh, without a lot of effect, uh, the New South Wales Government will be not applying the usual double demerit penalties this October long weekend, as most of us can't travel anyway or are too far away from home at this time of year. While there may not be double demerits in force for this October long weekend, road safety remains important and the usual police presence will be out and about. Again, I want to remind residents to travel safely by wearing seatbelts, adhering to the speed limit, using child restraints 
and no illegal mobile phone usage. The public inquiry has commenced as of yesterday through, the, and that should run from the 15th of October uh, through to the 15th of October. And it should be on screen between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Um, I do understand and I was one of the people affected because I did try to sort of watch it over the last couple of days, but I know the commissioner has experienced technical difficulties in live streaming interviews. But I do need to reiterate that this process, including the live streaming of public hearings, is managed by the commissioner and uh, the department uh, and the Office of Local Government. And her administrative staff are all the ones that actually manage it. It is entirely independent of council. For further updates on the public hearings or any other matters pertaining to the public hearing, please contact the Office of the Commissioner directly, or the details can be found on the Office of the Local Government website. So I wish them well in terms of uh, trying to resolve their technical difficulties. I note uh, tonight that open forum will not be conducted as there were no eligible requests to speak. I do want to remind community members that the open forum is not for raising matters that has already been determined by council or matters that are part of a current consultation process, but it's rather a forum for raising new questions or new concerns. So please remember that uh, if the council has made a decision on it, it is not a chance to revisit it and it is not about uh, trying to get precision motions or anything like that taken uh, down. So with that uh, general comments, I'm now going to resume the ordinary council meeting. I note that we have four community speakers uh, registered to speak on items on the agenda, and I will call those members uh, prior to the paper as it comes. Each member will be given three minutes to speak. A timer will be shown on the screen, so you will be able to keep track, and I will uh, have to stop you once you've gone past that. The other thing we will do is that there will be a small break. So when, when a speaker has finished, given that we would like them to be able to hear what the responses might be, uh, the webcast is in fact delayed. So there is approximately a minute's delay in the webcast, but we will just pause for a further 45 seconds to allow a person to come off there and log on and be able to hear the responses uh, if there are responses to it. It's just an important point that we will, we will do that, introduce that. So I'll move on to item 1.1, which is uh, disclosures of interest. I have no interest uh, to declare. I don't believe any of the staff are. If you have, just please you raise your hand. No, nope, nobody has got any, any uh, disclosures of interest. So I will now resolve the, uh, to adopt the resolution as shown on the screen. Item 1.2, the confirmation of the minutes of the previous meeting. I now have read the minutes and I now resolve to adopt the resolution as displayed on the screen. Item 1.3, notice of intention to deal with matters in closed session. There are no matters to discuss in closed session. So I will now resolve to adopt the resolution as displayed on the screen. We now move into the, into the uh, more formal part of the agenda. And item 2.1 is going to, is a regular item that we have on our, uh, our, our monthly reports. And this is the monthly report for August. And I would like the Chief Executive, Mr. David Farmer, to actually just take us through uh, some parts of this report and make some comments, because I think it's very important that the community does understand how we have kicked off this financial year. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. Um, this is the second month of regular monthly financial reporting to Council, which will be, uh, I guess, an institution as we go forward over the next um, little while. <clears throat> we went into this year with a plan to turn around the organisation's financial performance. Given two years of major losses, um, totalling in excess of $150 million, which required $150 million worth of emergency loans to ensure liquidity and enable Council to pay its staff and suppliers. Council developed a financial repair package that enabled the Council to begin to trade positively and allow it to recharge its reserves and pay out the emergency loans. That solution was, find, uh, was finding the approximately 70% in cost reductions and approximately 30% through increased rates. Two months into the year, we can see that this approach is on track. Council is showing a year-to-date operating surplus of $8 million versus a budget of under $3 million. This is underpinned by just a 3% increase in total income 
but a 15% reduction in cost year to date. Importantly, there's been a 31% reduction in employee costs and a 32.2% reduction in materials and contract costs against actual expenditure for the same period last year. So can I just stress that again, there's been a 31% reduction in employee costs and a 32.2% reduction in materials and contract costs for against exactly the same period last year. Last month, I showed a graph that showed the weekly payroll for the same time last year, as well as the weekly payroll for each week of the current year. We've now added a grey line to this, which is the 2015-16 year straight after the merger. So if I could just have that graph. <clears throat> and what we can see on the screen is the weekly payroll. The yellow line is last year, the full year last year. And you can see towards the end, there were major restructurings and that numbers were bouncing around, but you can see on average, it was bouncing around the $4 million rate. You can see the blue line, the blue line is this year to date. You can see it's almost a million dollars less per week than we were paying last year. But what's even more interesting, and these are all actual dollars, they've not been adjusted at all, these are actual dollars straight out of our payroll system. The grey line is the 2015-2016 years. So that is the combined payroll of the Gosford, the old Gosford and the old Wyong councils up until May of that year when they merged to be Central Coast Council. And you can see now the current payroll at Central Coast Council is in actual dollars, very, very similar to what it was five years ago. But over that period, awarding a wage increases have gone up by 14.4% and the population has grown by more than 6%. So the average wages cost per, uh, per resident in the city has gone down by about 20%. So I think that, I guess that's just a statement of what we've been able to do and some of the, some of the hard work that's had to happen and some of the sacrifice that's had to happen to restore ourselves uh, to financial health. Well, now, in the in the second table of page 11 of the attachment, you can see that the water and sewer business operating statement, you can see that, that business has lost $3.5 million in the two months to date, and we are budgeted to lose $11.6 million this financial year. This is a direct result of the adverse IPART pricing determination in 2019, which reduced annual water and sewer charges by 37% and moved... Uh, moved Central Coast's average charges from being a little higher than Sydney and Hunter Waters, and indeed being by some margin the lowest in the state. Unfortunately, that's led to significant losses, as well as a reduction in important maintenance and upgrades. This creates risks in terms of water quality, service, reliability, and environmental discharges to sensitive waterways. As you're aware, Council has recently lodged a water pricing submission to IPAR. This will be fully tested by IPART and any increase in pricing will be used to balance the budget and to invest in the performance of those assets. Once we strip the water and sewer assets out of the rest of the business, we can see that this is on track to deliver a surplus budget. While it's on track, the numbers are close and we will closely monitor this going forward. Uh, thank you, Mr. Farmer. I, I think it's, it is an amazing effort by the organisation to actually have been able to get itself down um, in such a short time frame uh, to be able to live within the parameters that are part of our understanding with the banking industry in terms of the, the funds we had to receive in order to uh, get, take us out of, um, out of receivership. So I think the results are really, really encouraging. And so it's congratulations to yourself and the team. I think you know, it's a marvellous start. Um, for the community, we had a 10-year plan, uh, the previous administrator and I put in place the 10-year plan, and you can see, whilst uh, we're only two months into it, uh, it is in fact working. And with good management, uh, which I strongly believe will be the case from this point onwards, uh, and good governance from a new elected body sometime, hopefully, eight next year, I believe it is right for the council to be able to move forward. But it does rely on uh, getting the income levels, which I'll have more to say about level, that are shown in the... Uh, 10-year plans. Um, there will be some rebalancing to do. Uh, it was a very blunt instrument that uh, got us down. Um, and again, I'll make some comments about a receivership. Uh, you do not have the luxury of time to 
you know, talk about Hare Krishna and other things about how you might change things, you have to do it by the next day. So I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, also in the detail, I think it's important from an accountability point of view, you will note that each of the business units, which are headed by a unit business unit manager, who is a level three manager in our organisation, reports to one of the executive, they now have full accountability for their business area. And those their business areas are all shown in the uh, appendices to the report. And it's important that you can look through that and you can see any part of the business, you can see how it's travelling. We allocate rates income to it based on a pro rata for on, basically on a pro rata uh, basis, although we actually receive the cash in lump sums. But in terms of for the financial reporting, we actually put it out uh, in monthly instalments, if you like, of the rate, uh, rates as they come in, rather than trying to have highs and lows of uh, you know, all the rates coming in uh, in one month and nothing coming in the next month. So we do spread it, even it out that way. So each uh, of the unit managers has to manage their expenditure according to where they are, and they have to forecast where they're going to end up the year. So those, man those unit managers there are now fully accountable uh, for delivering the results that we're now achieving. And I have to commend them because right now we are, you know, achieving the right results. So with that, I'm comments and the, the chief executive's comments, which I fully endorse and I congratulate uh, the executive and the, the general, uh, the CEO uh, for actually achieving where we are now and for maintaining it. It's a good job and I think it all goes well for the future. So with that, I'll adopt the resolutions that is uh, shown on the screen for item 2.1. We'll now move to item 2.2, .2, which is the investment report. Again, this is a regular monthly report, and I um, would like the uh, Chief Executive Officer, sorry, Chief Financial Officer, uh, Ms. Carly, to actually speak to that. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. The August 2021 investment report on page two provides a breakdown of the the funds that council has by the five different funds being the general fund, water fund, sewer fund, drainage fund and waste fund. And what is important to really look at is the unrest unrestricted funds row in that, in that table on page two. Um, and specifically focus on the red numbers that are shown in the water fund being $12 million in unrestricted fund deficit and the red number in the drainage fund, which is $37 million in unrestricted funds deficit, which is $49 million that is in a deficit. However, what is really good news, and for those of you that um, have been paying attention to this report over the past couple of months, you would see that the general funds position for the first time since, since we, we had the financial uh, crisis in October last year has for the first time come up to a unrestricted funds cash position. So we are no longer in deficit um, and we are showing $23 million in, in cash. This represents a $57 million turnaround between last month's position of $34 million deficit to this month's position of $23 million deficit. And this is actually confirmed and could be easily seen in the August financial monthly report that the chief executive officer presented um, just a minute ago, which shows that um, that is the amount of money that we've received for rates, charges, fees, grants, and internal revenue. And that is what's driving the cash position in this column. As mentioned a number of times in these meetings, this general fund unrestricted funds position is expected to bounce and it's expected to bounce um, back into deficits, perhaps next month, perhaps the month after and return back to a positive unrestricted funds position by um, May or June next financial year. What is useful to, to really uh, consider in this, in this report is the fact that in October or in September last year, 
the general fund unrestricted cash position was $205 million in a deficit. That is the $200 million that has been well documented and it's the, the number that council has been, um, ha has a plan to fulfill. That plan includes the $150 million in emergency loans that the chief executive officer uh, discussed just earlier. And those loans have not vanished. So council clearly has got the responsibility to pay $145 million um, in those loans over the next 10 years. And as, as explained in our long-term financial plan that was presented in um, June, this financial year, the, the way that um, this $150 million loans was being proposed to be paid is out of the operational, ex the operational um, results over the next 10 years, plus the uh, property sales that are on track. This plan obviously will not be able to be uh, accommodated with the current temporary uh, special rate variation of three years because the plan uh, expects a 10 year uh, special rate variation holding because that's the only way that we are able to repay those loans. And that is the basis of the special rate report that will be uh, considered in the next report, but it forms the basis and informs really the, um, the, the direction that this council is proposing in this space. Clearly, there are only two ways that this could be solved. We either get more revenue or we cut costs further. There's no third way of fixing the problem. So it would be irresponsible for council to not put the option of continuing the rate variation for the seven years to fix the uh, unrestricted cash deficit and be able to pay those loans. And clearly, if that is not accepted, um, the only other option would be to, to reduce uh, an already handicapped council further by cutting costs further and therefore significantly reducing the impact and the benefit and the value that is extracted by the community with, with a much lower level of service that this council could provide with a lower level of funds. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. Thank you for that very uh, full explanation. Um, it's uh, remarkable to reflect and uh, it's not till you mentioned it, uh, that it's nearly 12 months, the results that we were looking back ago when, as you say, the deficit uh, or the use of unlawful, the unlawful use of some of the uh, restricted reserves uh, was totaling around 205 million. And we're now down to where we're in positive territory. But I, I do note your comment that uh, that will move up and down uh, as the rates come in or and get spent. So um, it looks good for today, but uh, we do need to uh, project that I think the next couple of months uh, that may go back into negative territory. But overall, it's clear we're making good headway in terms of restoring uh, our current um, cash position, which again is absolutely paramount, along with our trading position to restore both that as well. The other thing that I think is important to note in there, and it's been covered both by the Chief Executive and by the CFO, but it may not be totally clear to the community. Um, we are going out looking at, uh, obviously, uh, increasing our fees and charges for water and sewer. And we're looking at uh, potentially in the next paper, uh, looking at uh, maintaining our current rate structure. It's an unusual situation that this council in, in fact, it, it is unique. It operates under two acts, the Water Management Act and the Local Government Act. And there is def definitely some conflict between the two. However, one of the things that is very important to note out of that is the deficit that is shown in water and drainage, the 49 million that the CFO mentioned, has to be propped up and funded by the general rate. So it can't exist in deficit. There's no, there has to be money there because it's being spent. So it is actually funded by the general rate. 
But if the reverse was to occur, and for example, the general rate was to lose money, and the water and sewer had money in them, then that money cannot go that way. It is a one-way gate. It can only go from the general rate site to support water and sewer. It cannot go the reverse way. That's very important to remember, and that compared to other water authorities, such as Hunter Water and Sydney Water, they can interchange and play with their water and sewer. We can't in local government because we're restrained by the Local Government Act. So I just want to point out that there are some, without trying to make it overly complicated, there are some uh, barriers to us being able to operate as flexibly and as freely as we would like, uh, simply due to the two acts that govern our financial reporting. But with that, I think it's pretty encouraging, the fact that we're making progress and uh, I'm very pleased to see that we've got it pretty much under, you know, I'll say under control. We know where we're going. We have the plan and it's working. And I think that's great. So with that, I will now uh, move the resolutions on, as shown on the screen. And I will just note uh, particularly um, resolution three, because it is important that we, where we have to actually nominate that we are occasionally having to use internally restricted funds to meet any deficit. And that we are having to do in this case to meet the deficit of sewer and, uh, sorry, of water and drainage of the 49 million. So we can do that on a monthly basis. You will see that appearing in, in the resolutions. And that is just to make sure we're legal. The council can resolve to uh, allocate internally restricted. It can't do it for external, but it can do it for internally restricted. Uh, so we just do that every month just to cover off the fact that we are still balancing things up and down as we go through this uh, rebuild period. So with that, uh, I do resolve to move all those and adopt all those resolutions that are shown on the screen. We'll now move to item 2.3, which is the special rate variation application by council. Now we have two speakers there, so I'd just like to remind the two speakers, Mr. Joy Cooper, who will go first, and Mr. Kevin Brooks, uh, who will go second, that the is three minutes. A bell will go at the end of the three minutes, and I will be winding you up at that point in time. And as I said, I will give you some moments to rejoin uh, the, um, the conversation. But do, do uh, remember that there is a time delay. So when you come back on, uh, you'll actually won't have missed much, but I will give you some extra time there to come back on. So with that, we'll uh, ask... Uh, Ms. Joy Cooper to come on, please. Thank you. I wonder if the administrator just made his morning coffee to click on the Office of Local Government's YouTube channel at 10 a.m. yesterday and today in time for the commencement of the Central Coast Council public inquiry. I wonder if as a non-resident of this region, he felt the level of indignity that I and many others in the community felt. We were promised a public inquiry, a full and fair investigation of what occurred at Central Coast Council between 2017 and October 2020. The New South Wales Government, the Office of Local Government, thought it so little of the people living on the Central Coast that they treated us with utter contempt yesterday and today. We've been made many promises since 2015 when this New South Wales Government started its Fit for the Future push. We were promised there would be no forced amalgamations, yet our councils were sacked. We were promised the Central Coast Council Mega Council, one of the largest in the country, would gain access to enormous amounts of funding and would save money for residents and ratepayers. Yet here we are, six years later, in administration, in debt, and facing another round of rate and water weight increases. Now we are told, and I expect Administrator Hart, that you will resolve this evening that it's worth expending $150,000 on consultation that will give you exactly the same result as you got a year ago. Last time you consulted the community about a proposal special rate variation, you were told in no uncertain terms that we, the people, didn't want one. We believe the failure of the Central Coast Council has been politicised and those that are truly responsible for the mess will be held, won't, uh, won't be held accountable. As usual, the proposal to form a randomly selected community reference group to assist the process to either getting a special rate variation or cutting services if you fail is very light on detail. 
How many people? How will they be randomly selected? Will random selection result in the group being representative of the demographics and psychographics of the Central Coast community? How exactly will $150,000 be spent? Is there a project plan with a budget that we could see prior to you making the decision tonight? I understand that IPART places a great deal of emphasis, perhaps too much, on how a council asking for a special rate variation indeed engaged with, the communi with its community. It's more about the process and the substance or the outcome. Reports released by local government experts in recent days indicate that there is no need for the Central Coast Council to run off to the commercial banks to get out of their cash flow problems last year. As a result of the actions of this administration, the Central Coast Council finds itself in more debt, more costly debt than it had before. What will a randomly selected community reference group tell you that you don't already know? If you want to know what the community really thinks, Add some questions to your quarter two rate notice or at least a link to, to that that people can go to and comment. The best and fairest consultation, and you know it, is when everyone gets a say. It may not tick IPART's consultation boxes, but it will certainly tell you what the residents of the Central Coast really think about your special rate variation. Thank you, Joy. Um, well, now, uh, if you want to log off and uh, log back in. I'll let you just take some time to do that. Okay, uh, we'll see if Mr. Kevin Brooks is available. Yes, Kevin. Rick, we must, start, we must stop meeting like this, Rick. Can you hear me? <laughs> Rick, you've got three minutes, sir. <laughs> and then I will give you time to, to log out and log back in again so that uh, you don't miss anything. I'll start. So this new 15% rate hike combined with the proposed 34% water rate hike amounts to an extraction of economic rent on a grotesque scale by a monopoly service provider. A community with no choice of service provider and no democratic rights is being gouged in violation of rational enlightenment principles, not least that there should be no taxation without representation. This allocation raises 260 million over 10 years above the rate cap. Yet council has repeatedly stated it only needs 110 million from rates to repay loans. Put another way, ratepayers are being asked to cough up an extra 26 million a year when only 11 million a year is being needed for the loans. The rest appears to be funding a recurring and structural budget deficit. IPART's last determination agreed with me on this point when it stated, and I quote, the council's proposal to increase its rates is inconsistent with its intention to use the SV funds to repay the loans. Council needs to answer a fundamental question here. What is driving this recurring deficit despite general rates having risen year on year by inflation or more and services having been cut? I stand by the answer I gave last time and payroll reductions over the past year are not relevant to those arguments that I made about salary and other cost increases, cost increases that appear to have worked their way into the budget base and are now recurring, nor in themselves do they improve productivity, a measure of output per employee, which published numbers suggest is still lower than five years ago. Now, turning to recommendation number six on the community reference group. This council has a poor track record on the conduct of community consultation. I, I don't have time to detail all the examples, but it is very important this engagement group does not repeat some of the biases that we saw last SRV, such as the telephone survey of 400 residents, which I've been looking at the report here. 
those lucky 400 residents were read a concept statement spruiking the benefits of a rate rise before being asked if they supported one. It sounds like something out of an Orwellian dystopia. And key facts within the concept statement, including the weak rate increase, were actually inaccurate. So I'm asking Mr. Farmer for an assurance tonight that a further report will be present presented, setting out the, the method, method of random, random sample collection and the and information, information and options provided, provided to the so wider so wide community to this, this information, information for fairness and bias. But at the end of the day, the only consultation that will count will be an election be held before this rate hike can be implemented. And it won't be a contrived, controlled focus group debate based on a false dichotomy between rate hikes and service cuts. Efficiency, productivity, and the costs of the bureaucracy will be part of that debate. Thank you, Mr. Brooks, um, for that. Um, Can I come in under three minutes there, Rick? Yeah, you know, you're well and truly past the three minutes. The bell went, actually, I gave you about an extra 20 seconds. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, I, I appreciate. I'm very no. I, I kind of when well, in that case, I, 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 I appreciate, it. and I would like to thank you for that. Yeah, I, 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 I feel like not at the rub of the green in previous ones, so I thank you yeah. for that very much. No problem. We'll give you a few minutes now to go offline and come back on. Okay, well, we'll move on. Hopefully, Mr. Brooks and Ms. Cooper have been able to uh, join us. So I'm going to ask the Chief Executive, Mr. Farmer, to make some opening comments to uh, this particular item. Then I have a couple of questions for the uh, CFO down the track. So, Mr. Farmer, would you like to uh, ask some comments on this? Uh, last year, in uh, at the height of the financial crisis, uh, Council applied for a special variation to rates to generate 13% above the 2% statewide rate peg and to remain permanently in the rate base. After considering that, IPART provided Council with an increase as requested for three years only and saying that during this three year period, the council will be able to implement its proposed business recovery plan and can consult with its ratepayers regarding appropriate service levels and if required, apply for a permanent special rate variation. It's fair to say that the most um, recent uh, experience with IPART last year was in the middle of the financial crisis and the resultant application created a considerable amount of concern and anger amongst the community. And that's being borne out in the public inquiry that's on at the moment. It was difficult to have a calm and reasoned dialogue during this difficult and urgent time when council was struggling to secure private finance to allow it to be able to pay its staff and its suppliers. But council has now come out of a period of extremely significant restructure with a vastly lower cost structures. And I explained um, a little bit of that in the earlier matters on the report today both our materials and services costs year to date and our wages year to date are 30% lower than last year. It's on track to achieve its budget targets as outlined in the first report on the agenda and it will be able to service its general fund loans provided its water and sewer business is given a pricing outcome that enables it to break even. And as I identified, um, the water and sewer business is currently at a loss due to the fact that our water pricing is considerably by far the lowest in the state. However, council faces a substantial fall in income in a little 
um, under three years' time. It should be noted that Council's 10-year financial plan not only requires a positive trading performance, but in order to repay restricted funds and the emergency loans, a substantial surplus are required for the next 10 years. However, Council faces a substantial income loss in less than three. There is currently a public inquiry underway into the financial crisis. Without prejudging its findings, I believe it will find that leadership failed to appreciate the financial risks facing the council, and when they did, failed to take decisive action to address this. So the current leadership of council now face a similar scenario where council will face a significant decrease in income. As a result, the council either needs to take action to secure that income or alternatively adjust the business to cope with the loss of that income. And if we do have to cope with the loss of that income, that will require both the loss of staff and services. And I should stress that Council has had major cost reductions and restructures recently. And while some ongoing efficiencies will continue to be found, these, it would be anticipated, will be reinvested in gradually returning some of those services that have had to be cut in the most recent budget. So as suggested by IPART, it's proposed that we undertake a process of consultation with the community to explain the pros and cons of retaining the current rating structure and maintaining and slowly growing services, or conversely, having what would be around 11.3% rate decrease and seeing a range of council services reduced. So the report proposes that we notify IPART that we wish to undertake a SRV process to maintain the current rating levels for another seven years on top of the three already granted. It should be noted, and as Mr. Brooks mentioned, uh, even if this is approved by IPART, the future rating levels will be set by the council of the day. The levels set by IPART will be the maximum and the elected council is able to set uh, any level up to that. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Um, now, I have a couple of questions I do want to ask here. Um, I believe uh, Ms. Cowley is probably best placed to answer them. Um, the first one is Mr. Brooks mentions in his conversation that uh, we haven't um, made any progress with uh, efficiency gains. I, I believe just even in your area alone, there's been some quite um, substantial gains made in the last uh, period. Would you like to just make any comments around what has actually been achieved? Just so that we can um, you know, <laughs> relieve Mr. Brooks of one of his anxieties. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. I guess for those residents that have uh, paid attention to Council's well-publicised financial situation and have um, understood it, it wouldn't be a surprise what some of the key productivity improvements uh, are. So I am going to remind uh, those, those residents of the the, I guess the, the most visible productivity improvements. And then I'm going to provide a flavoring of some of the internal uh, productivity improvements, which obviously wouldn't be uh, able to be understood by uh, residents without actually, I guess, listening directly from council as opposed to making speculations. In terms of productivity improvements, uh, obviously we are divesting the Gos Gosford building. Um, as a result, we're relocating over 300 staff to alternative locations in order to optimize usage. We have, as explained by the administrator, the, the two administrators and also the CEO on multiple occasions, we have delivered over $50 million of efficiency savings from employee costs and materials and contracts. This is on an annual basis, $50 million. Um, as as the, the CEO explained, $31 million in employee costs, $22 million in materials and contracts. It's a structural reduction that is called a productivity saving because we, as, as the CEO explained, we, have had, uh, we haven't had a 31% reduction in services but we have had a 31% reduction in employee costs and 32% reduction in materials and contracts. And therefore the only way that we can do that is by productivity improvements. 
we have sold $50 million of underperforming property assets, therefore enabling the community to actually get a better, better value out of those pro um, property assets. And there's obviously $30 million that is still to come. The, we've obviously have a very, a ver very well understood uh, process that, that has caused efficiency uh, and productivity improvements and it's called harmonization of rates. Clearly, we don't have to have now additional staff that are, that, are, uh, that are managing the rates of two different systems on two different systems uh, in, in two different ways. Um, and that leads to productivity improvements. And now in terms of additional flavoring that probably hasn't been mentioned before, and that is only a flavoring from my, my unit. So it's, it's a tiny portion of everything that actually is occurring in this council. We have, for example, um, provided electronic requisitions across the entire business and therefore reduced paper-based requisitions, uh, not only reducing printing, but, but improving and, and streamlining and, and increasing the speed of delivery of, of documents across. We have consolidated two financial systems into one. So clearly, we don't have to do things two separate ways. Uh, we've introduced self-serve financial management reporting, um, which is called Power Budget, and it's one of the key drivers of the fact that the community is able to get that transparency of, of councils reporting through the management reporting that council uh, uh, provides on its website on a, on a monthly basis now. We have rolled out mobile asset management for field workers. Again, there's no paper processes. We have rolled out technology mobility um, so in a way, we've been in COVID. Council has not stopped operating all of its staff as it, as it is. You could see all of us. Um, we, are, we are in uh, all sorts of locations um, and we are able to uh, successfully execute a live streaming event um, that is able to um, provide information to the community. Uh, we have enabled desk book booking software, which actually has uh, introduced activity-based working and is one of the drivers of ensuring that we are able to actually have all of our people at different locations because there is uh, activity-based working that enables that. Uh, we have implemented collaboration software, such as the one that you see at the moment, and that also has reduced the travel between locations. Uh, we've rolled out electronic forms and automated workflows. Uh, we've harmonized the five pay cycles into one. We've implemented one payroll solution. Uh, we've introduced a maintenance work order systems. We've consolidated major facility contracts. Uh, we've streamlined two call centers into one. And um, as a result, council has only one phone number to call. Uh, we've reduced three intranets into one, reduced three corporate websites into one, reduced two engagement online platforms into one, which might be quite well known for those, of those residents that actually um, enjoy participating in council discussions. And that's called Your Voice, Our Host. Um, we've clearly introduced the monthly reporting on the internet and that's with a much lower number of staff um, and higher output and additional transactional um, visibility. We've harmonized the site management and the security procedures across all of our different facilities and public, public toilets and um, depots and halls. Uh, we've reduced GPS tracking in over 620 fleet assets. So we are able to instantly be able to see the utilization of vehicles and whether there are certain um, work that needs to maintenance work that needs to happen. Uh, we've rolled out harmonized fleet assets register. We've introduced car sharing as a centralized method to replace the low utilized business pool cars. And we've optimized fuel tax credit technology. And that only just touches really the surface of some of the processes and improvements that this council has has delivered over over the period of time. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. Um, I, I believe a pretty exhaustive list, uh, and that's just basically largely from the areas that uh, uh, Ms. Cowley is responsible for. So there's been other uh, productivity gains in other parts of the business, which the other executives have been uh, doing. And as Mr. Uh, as Mr. Farm pointed out quite clearly, we have not reduced 
our service levels by 30%. So productivity is automatic. And exactly with, your, with the definitions that Mr. Brooks gave, we are producing more or the same with much less people. And that is definitely the definition of productivity. So I think we are hopefully uh, demonstrated that we're on a pathway with that. No one would say that we've reached or exhausted where we can go. Um, there's a lot more to do, an awful lot more to do, because I would agree with Mr. Brooks, prior to uh, us commencing back just before Christmas last year, uh, but that was uh, Ms. Cowley and myself and the administrator, Mr. Person, uh, I do believe there had been very little done in the way of productivity gains. But since then, there has been a lot been going on under the radar, so to speak. So hopefully we've made it quite clear that we are doing some work in that, in that particular area. Now, the other question I do want to ask Ms. Cowley is, is something that Mr. Brooks sort of referred to that uh, IPART gave us the three years and we should be respecting that and all the rest. But uh, as this paper is pointing out, we need to go now. Would you, could you please explain uh, the reasons why we need to go now as opposed to waiting for three years? Thank you, Mr. Administrator, and um, I'd, I'd, I'd request uh, the, the, the slide to be presented on the screen. Thank you so much, team. Um, so this provides a timeline options. Um, with everything that happens at the, this council, there is a logical reason and a logical explanation, and uh, there, there are no, uh, I guess, flippant uh, re work that is being done um, without any justification and going through a proper process. So uh, there are two timeline options, um, and this specifically identifies and discusses why we are progressing with a SRV application um, in this financial year as opposed to next, for example. And the reason for that is if we go and submit an application in February 2022 for the SRV. The IPART results are provided in May 22. Being conservative and I guess thoughtful um, in the process, we assume the worst. And so if the IPART determination is that they would not provide council with a seven year extension of or maintenance of the SRV, existing SRV, then council will need to commence a restructuring process in June 2022. Having had the benefit of a very similar in size restructuring process that council undertook uh, at the beginning of this financial year, we do know that this process will take six months. So if we start the restructuring process in June 22, then the restructuring will be completed by December 2022. Um, I'm sure that Mr. Brooks and um, other financiers will be well, well aware that uh, in order to secure a finance loan, you need to provide a financial history specifically, especially in a situation when you have a significant reduction in costs. And so the banks, in our case, the banks that have provided us the emergency loans that the CEO has discussed, they require at least one year financial history to rely on to ensure that we have got, council has got itself in a situation where the proposal of our reductions uh, have actually not only been budgeted for, but they have been lived in. And in order to provide that one year financial history, um, that will mean that between December 2022 and December 2023, when the loan comes for refinancing, we would be in a position to be able to justify uh, why we are able to refinance it. Clearly, the second option, which starts with the orange view and it's um, going into, my, into the SRV process for February 2023, that ensures that then the IPRAD results come in May 2023. If, again, in this particular situation, IPRAD give us a no and uh, they don't provide us an opportunity to maintain the rates, then the restructuring will begin in June. 2023, which means that it will be completed by December 23, which is actually the time when the loan is due for refinancing, which means that there is absolutely no financial history provided to show that the restructuring exercise that had just been undertaken uh, will be one that council can live with. And therefore that puts into a 
um, jeopardy that $100 million loan. Why? Because council has got four major banks to, to borrow funds from. Um, the type of funding security that council can obtain for this particular situation is not one that uh, a government um, entity such as T-Corp funds or supports. So therefore the only options for council that are accepted options are the four major banks and council has got loans with three major banks and uh, we have got uh, we have got regular conversations with with the banks uh, because none of them, none of the three would like to be in a situation where suddenly council is in a, in a position where it can't pay its, its loans. And therefore, if there is such a situation that might be occurring, I'm sure that one or two would be able, would, or all three would like to call on their loans straight away and that would create a further problem for council. Now with that, um, if it's okay, Mr. Administrator, I'd like to I'd like to comment on on a couple of um, items that that were raised by Miss Cooper and Miss Brooks. Uh, one of the items that Miss Cooper mentioned is that um, council needs to hear that the community does not want a special rate variation. Um, we understand that there is, I guess, there is a maturity of argument that occurs and it's called the difference between want and a need. Um, I guess council and most, I guess most adults in Australia, if you ask them whether they want to pay tax, whether it's 20%, 30%, 40% or, or more, would they want to do it? Uh, they probably would say, no, we don't want to do it. And we probably don't want to pay it at 40% or 30% or whatever. Um, clearly we need to do it. Um, and the point of this um, exercise of actually going through uh, a uh, external process of randomly selecting people, and yes, um, it is going to be random selected by an external provider without that would ensure that the process is independent and therefore the selection would ensure that there would be a fair representation of sex demographics, um, psychographics and everything else statistical require, required in order to ensure that that selection is a statistically proven and accept, acceptable um, process. Then what council is, is um, going to, to ensure is that we provide the information that would enable logical people that would have the open mind to understand the, the situation and the explanation to then be able to make an informed decision ba based on logical reasons and rational reasons rather than emotional reasons of we don't want something. Um, this is also the reason why when we provide a um, survey, we have to provide a explanation and logical reason to that. Um, to Mr. Brooks' point, this is not spruiking um, when we do a survey. Um, the surveys are undertaken by professionals whose job it is to do surveys and to provide that level of independence. And as a result, um, the information that is provided is, is actually statistically correct. And it is and it is the logical reason as to why council requires or needs something. Um, the question that was raised by jo Joy Cooper was, um, is there going to be a project plan? Absolutely, there is a project plan. Um, this, this process and this council has uh, numerous times, it's been said that there is bureaucracy or part of the, uh, part of the um, definition of bureaucracy is that you have to jump through a lot of hoops and follow a lot of processes. And therefore um, there is no, uh, random work that can occur without a proper project plan and defined, defined reason of expectation um, to, that, to that amount of work that we're trying to, to achieve. There was also the comment that we didn't need to run to the commercial banks um, based on a uh, external report. Um, again, um, as you might know, not everything that is posted in the media is, is informed 
correctly. Uh, so the, the suggestion that council cannot or did not need to run to, to the commercial banks. Uh, uh, the only thing that it does prove is that the person did not understand the regulation requirements by the OLG placed on this council. Um, in terms of Mr. Brooks' comment about monopoly service provider, um, that is the reason why we are uh, regulated under IPART. Um, there is a most water and sewer providers are monopolies. Uh, that's why there is Hunter Water and Sydney Water. There's not, not three different Hunter Water versions, um, but that is the reason why you have an IPART regulator to ensure that that is, um, that, is uh, that occurs. The concern around uh, lack of uh, consultation by an elected body Clearly, the SRV application will still apply for, an, for um, a period in three years' time when an elected body is actually uh, operating at council and therefore they have got the ability to change that decision. And I think finally, what I wanted to clarify was that there is this, I would say, expectation or speculation that council somehow took the $200 million and council staff took, took a portion of the $200 million in their pockets, ran away and went home and took it there. That could not be further away from the truth. So in terms of the fact that the residents feel ripped off by council's mismanagement, the reality is that as explained by the CEO, for three years, council had a $39 million per year reduction in water and sewer costs. That is a $120 million water and sewer holiday that council absorbed in its muscles. And really, as explained quite clearly, we are the lowest water and sewer provider with one of the largest areas that we have to serve in New South Wales. Let me repeat, we are the lowest. So there is generally a consistency between the amount of money that you pay and the service that you get. At this point, this council has received the lowest amount of money for water and sewer. And we are also not reduced our service to represent the lowest service provision in this space. And so that's $120 million in water and sewer holiday. And, we, and then also we had $70 million extra in capital investments. Those capital investments are there for the community to benefit from. We didn't take it in our pocket at home. They are for the benefit of the community. So the expansion or the, 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 um, the money that this council has expended is money that has been directly contributed and, and has been directly beneficial to this community. And what this council is doing is having a plan to solve that situation and to bring the Central Coast into its rightful position of being not only one of the biggest council areas in New South Wales, but absolutely one of the best. And we know that we are in one of the best because that's why the property prices has had one of the highest increases. A lot of people want to come and join us here. And we have to be able to have a financially sustainable council to sustain that level of service. Thank that's you, Mr. Great. Administrator. Thank, thank you. Um, very, very full explanation. And thank you for the explaining the, the reasons why we need to go um, uh, this year for an application as opposed to, opposed to waiting. Now, I'll just sum this up and then we'll move on. But um, just in, in short, I think uh, between the CEO and the CFO, they've done a more than adequate job trying to explain to the community just where we sit 
and where things are. But just hold that slide for a moment. I'll use that in a moment. Um, so what will happen going forward is when this is approved, uh, this paper, you will then start to see the program of consultation will come out. Uh, this is just the formal notification of this paper that we have to do just to alert the community and alert, uh, formally alert IPART that we will be putting an application in to maintain the current rate structure. That's all it's doing. It is not attempting to put out the full uh, consultation process and all the rest. That all comes a bit later. So sorry, uh, Ms. Cooper, but that will actually come later, all those questions that you raised. Um, it has to be remembered. It has to be remembered that whichever way you look at it, this organisation, when I arrived and when Dick Person arrived, when the CFO arrived one week before us, had just the week prior not been able to pay a $4 million wage bill. It had no ability to pay approximately a $40 million payables creditors' bills. It had no ability to do that. We had to source. We tried asking for money from the state government. That was refused. It's very difficult when you think about it, because the money that was used was money that under the Local Government Act is specifically set aside to be spent on the purpose for which it was collected from. It is like a trust fund, or it is like your superannuation. It is not available to get at. The government did not allow us to access any of the, those funds that were in the bank. And they did say to us, we needed to look at commercial solutions. There are only two sources of commercial solutions when you are in receivership, which is when you cannot pay your bills when they fall due. Shareholders either tip the money in, or you have to go and borrow. In our case, uh, we didn't have much opportunity to go to all our shareholders or ratepayers, and not surprisingly, I doubt whether we would have collected much. The other one that you might consider as a shareholder or certainly a stakeholder, the state government had refused. That included T Corp, who, uh, as they said to me quite clearly, they are not a bank. They provide money for infrastructure. We were requiring funds to restructure a business, provide us a cash flow, and to help take us uh, to, fill, to fund a plan to take us out of insolvency. Now, I don't know whether Mr. Brooks or Ms. Carley have ever been through a receivership of a, when they've been working for an organisation or whether, in fact, they've ever managed one. I have. I was the CEO of an organisation, a medium-sized food distribution company, uh, which ran into financial difficulty. It was not a pleasant experience. And the decisions that had to be made had to be made within hours and maximum days. There was no time to sit around and work out where we were going to do efficiency gains and everything else. We had to make hard decisions to satisfy our bankers as to what conditions and what our forecast looked like if we put these in place. They had to be convinced. And that is precisely what we had to do. As the CFO has outlined and the CEO has outlined, we had to sell assets. We had to cut costs, which we have done uh, to an extensive level. We had to also pop up our revenue side, which was the 13% on top of the rate cap of 2%, which made a total of 15% which we had to go for. And we had to try and redress the $39 million or 20% of the water sewer drainage fees and charges uh, that was taken off us by IPART back in the end of 2019 financial year. So with all of that, we put that together. Now those decisions had to be made and acted upon within weeks. And we got, this, we got it in two tranches. We got a $50 million loan in the first tranche, which we got, I think, on memory serves as well, the second week of November. So within 10 days of being there, we, we actually told our, our creditors that we uh, couldn't pay them right then, so we didn't pay that. 
We managed to get $6 million from the state government, which covered the wage bill. And then the next one we got was when we got the 50 million in, which lasted us through approximately just before Christmas. And that's when we finally managed to secure the $100 million to take us through. Now we have to repay that money. There's no ifs or buts about that. That's the conditions on which the money was lent to us. So for all the talk that there was, didn't need to rush off to the banks or didn't need to do anything else, without that, no one would have been paid Staff wouldn't have been paid. Creditors, a lot of small businesses around the state wouldn't have been paid. So as the responsible officer coming in, the two responsible officers, the CFO and myself, and the administrator, we had to put in place the restructure plan, which we did. We're now in a situation where we have to apply to IPART for an increase in the water and sewer fees, which only take us back to approximately where we were. Um, three years ago. So they only take us back to that. So it's a recovery of what we lost. And the SRV, we're not looking to increase it. We're looking to maintain it for the life of the 10 year plan, which is a further seven years over and above the three years we already have got. And that is in order to be able to repay the loan. If we don't do that, then we will have to cut costs again. So to go out for consultation to make it very easy for the community, and look, I, I respect very much the views of uh, Ms. Cooper and Mr. Brooks. They are absolutely entitled to say what they like and put submissions in. But all I want them to be aware of and to be clear about is the consequences of what happens from this point onwards. We will be putting out for consultations two 10-year plans. They will total 10 years. One, We'll respect the IPART current decision, which is to remove 26 million or $27 million from our revenue line at the end of 20 financial year 20, ending July, uh, June 30, 24. We'll remove that. There will be consequences to that uh, because uh, I cannot make cuts that uh, will endanger public safety. I, I cannot break um, the law or harm the environment. So as a result of that, many of those costs and service will be targeted to include the culture areas, theatres and so on, sports, community services, economic development, things like tourism. We will not be able to partner with the state or the federal government on new projects because we won't have a capacity to do that. So the two plans, the other plan is that we stay as we are, so the current service level. And as Mr. Farmer pointed out, I would fully expect that we will get uh, more productivity gains and there will be more money to be able to improve the services from where they are right now. And furthermore, the final determinant will be a new government, a new council, when elected, I hope uh, towards the end of next year, will be able to either implement, if we were successful with the IPART uh, reviews, or not implement. That will be open for them to have a discussion with the community. But I have, my job is to keep the organisation afloat. So there will be two options to go to the community. One, to continue as we are. The other, to reduce costs. So when we get the IPART determination as a result of them talking and discussing with the community and our feedback from the community through our consultation process, if the IPART decision is that uh, they cannot uh, agree to support our request to continue or maintain current rate structure, then we will, as you can see from the SRV timelines, we will have to start restructuring and taking approximately $26, $27 million off our costs in order to have a trading history to be able to renew those loans uh, in November, December, um, two and a half, just a bit over two years' time. We've got to renew uh, those loans and uh, we will need to go to the banks demonstrating that we still have the surpluses and the capacity to repay. If we can't demonstrate that, they will ask for their money back. So I cannot risk, as an administrator, I cannot risk the organisation not taking in cognizance of the risks in front of us and not taking action to make sure that we are protected. All I can do is give the options very clearly to the community and let the community choose whichever way they want to go. And that's what we will be doing. So as I said, I've had the responsibility of going through the receivership. 
and you have no luxuries. You cannot sit down and say, oh, we will, we will put in place a, a business excellence program to improve this. The bank is not interested in that. The bank is interested in what are you going to cut out today so that tomorrow your cost line is adjusted to fit your revenue side. We have done that component. The business excellence side, a lot of the work that has to go into the um, productivity area is still yet to come. Because Mr. Brooks was 100% correct back in uh, November last year when he said none of this was in place. It is a different world now, and we're well on the pathway to actually making it a lot better. But as I said, the final decision will rest with the, with the community. But with that, I have to notify IPART of our intentions, and I will do that by moving the, recommend, the, re the recommendations and the, the resolutions, which I'd like to put up on the screen now, please. So these are the recommendations, resolutions for item 2.3, the special rate variation application. And uh, with all that commentary, I will now move all of those and uh, pass them as a resolution of council. Thank you. We'll now move on to item 2.4, which is the draft one of our district contributions plan 2021 the outcomes of the public exhibition and adoption of plan. We have a speaker for that, Mr. David Kitson, and I would like to hope that Mr. Kitson is available and uh, you have your three minutes. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, my name is David Kitson. Um, I was formerly the Senior Contribution Officer um, at Council and I was responsible for preparing the uh, one of our district uh, contribution plan that uh, is in place at the moment. Uh, oh, yes. The first, um, the first thing I would like to say is that, you know, the, uh, the report that's been put forward to Council doesn't um, acknowledge the fact that uh, there may well be unfunded liabilities under the plan. Um, I'm surprised that that uh, section wasn't in the report. Um, and I go back to the um, uh, 2015 when the existing plan was first adopted, uh, was adopted as an amendment. Um, and um, the, the unfunded liability under that plan was uh, calculated at 30, $39.2 million. So that is basically, you know, when it, all development is, happens in the one of our district area um, uh, and you've done as much as you can, you're still gonna have 30, 32 million, 30, $39 million uh, worth of works that haven't been completed and have to um, get funding from elsewhere. Now um, that was, uh, there's some hope that um, that will come down um, given that there's um, a proposal to um, re uh, remove $77 million from the plan. Uh, look, and uh, sorry, I, I, I just uh, go sideways and apologise for having to bring a lot of this stuff up now. I wasn't aware of the uh, exhibition. I would have put in a, a more fulsome um, submission if I had a name. I only found out about the plan coming up to Council last week uh, and have gone through it. And um, because I'm relatively familiar with it, I kind of... Um, have a pretty good understanding about uh, the issues. Now, look, uh, in, in terms of calculating the unfunded liability, you know, basically there's a process there and I've, I've kind of um, asked for some notes, um, my talking notes to be available uh, on screen and there's a, there's a table there um, that will uh, indicate, you know, the, the type of um, um, uh, calculation that you need to make. And uh, basically, um, you know, it's, it's a matter of, uh, having a look at how much money you've got in the bank from the funds, having a look at how much you're going to collect in the future, um, any money that you're going to get from land sales, uh, taking that away, uh, and then from that um, uh, addition, taking away uh, what your uh, the value of the um, infrastructure that has yet to be provided, and, and also any non-cash credits, which is another issue. But uh, that's that's the table that essentially. Uh, informed council in 2015 about the um, uh, unfunded liability under plan. So that hasn't been addressed in this um, report. Uh, look, the, um, the, uh, the look, there are many positive things um, in, in the uh, plan. Um, and, um, you know, there's some things that kind of have been long overdue to, to, to be changed. Uh, but, you know, one of the, one of the, uh, um, one of the principal issues is the amalgamation of catchments. 
and that that um, that is um, has some serious concerns in respect to um, the, the East Warnervale District uh, plan, uh, East East uh, Warnervale District catchment, because there are there are rural areas that haven't been um, um, haven't been zoned and for which the development infrastructure has not been um, calculated for that. So including that in the in the overall uh, catchment. Uh, potentially um, in the future will lead to um, an unfunded liability. And I can explain that by saying if there was a 10 million, if, if during the rezoning process, uh, you know, it was identified that there was $20 million worth of... Um, Mr. Kit, Mr. Kitts, you've used your three minutes. So we'll give you another 15 seconds, so just to wrap up. Well, th there's some important issues here that um, uh, really uh, are just going to go by the way, uh, unless you give me just a little bit more. Um, uh, no, I guess afraid I, afraid I, I, I can give you another, you know, 15, 20 seconds just to wrap up, but I can't give you any more. It's not fair to other speakers either, you see. Uh, yeah. uh, look, I guess the issue is that um, there's certainly one of the costs uh, for the rehabilitation of the floodplain is totally inadequate. There's a nine hundred thousand um, dollar figure. Well, council had some. Um, $15 million they calculated uh, in 2016 for that, that work. Um, so um, that's, um, uh, but the, the issue really is um, the, the, the combining of a lot of catchments that are, have different um, characteristics and uh, there's potential for unfunded liabilities, um, uh, especially in respect to the area. The I think I picked up the main point. Thank the, you. Um, Thank you Thank you, Mr. Kitt. North of the one of our town centre. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I certainly appreciate your knowledge, uh, you know, as a next staff person, and um, thank you for taking the time to come in and put together a table and so on. Um, I'm going to certainly ask uh, Mr. Cox to respond to the points you points you've uh, raised as he talks to the paper. So um, I will give you some time just to uh, let that, that take place if you wish to. Rejoin us. Mr. Cox available? I am Mr. Administrator. Thank you. Um, I think, I believe you've got uh, just a short presentation, but uh, clearly you will have heard Mr. Kitson's comments and uh, his concerns. Um, I would certainly be interested to understand what your response is to the concerns he's made. I, I sure. Largely around the unfunded liabilities. Um, I believe I understood the paper, but uh, he he has a different view, so I'd like you to take me through as to uh, why we're still correct. Sure, Mr. Administrator, and and thank you to Mr. Kitson for taking the time to read the paper and and come and uh, ask some some very uh, good questions tonight. So, in terms of, uh, I'll, I'll I'll go through uh, the the five points that that, that Mr. Kitson has raised. Uh, first of all, um, the unfunded liability. Basically, in in Mr. Kitson's presentation, he talks about a point of in time, in 2015. So a number of amendments have been made between 2000, the 2014 plan and the current plan, the 21 plan, that have resulted in changes to the financial status of the plan. Firstly, calcul calculating contribution rates based on per person instead of dwelling unit. This change has been made to better align with section 711 legislation and state government best practice. Secondly, increasing the occupancy rates in the plan to align with current and forecast rates. We've also removed $88 million of state road infrastructure that is being funded by the state government and is not the responsibility of council. Um, fourthly, we're simplifying the way contributions are calculated by reducing the subcatchments in the plan and rationalising the infrastructure to be provided under the plan as well as updating land valuations and we had a quantity surveyor review all the infrastructure costs. So throughout the preparation of the Warnervale Plan 2021, 
it was determined that the Warner Vale plan of 2014 was unnecessarily complicated, difficult to administer, and there was no governance arrangements in place or documentation for works in kind agreements that had been um, that had been executed. A review of the Warner Vale plan of 2014 was undertaken to assess the status of the works in the plan, determining what works are still required to be delivered. Now, this is best practice in terms of reviewing the plans. The plan was well overdue for review and ongoing reviews should be done on a five yearly basis going forward. Once the status of the plan was determined, a financial impact analysis was undertaken that considered existing contribution balances held by council, remaining infrastructure to be delivered and future income to be received under the plan. The financial impact analysis showed that the works proposed under the plan are able to be funded and that there is no unfunded liability. I must mention too, in the plan, it does talk about the recreation centre, um, which is not fully funded in the plan. Um, there will be an 8% um, shortfall in there, which it talks about in the plan, but that 8% can be recovered by adjoining uh, contributions plans when they are amended uh, to cover that facility because it's a regional facility and will not just be used by people uh, in the Warnervale area, but also people in surrounding areas such as uh, San Remo and up at Gwondolin. Now, in terms of the, uh, the cost of the floodplain um, that Mr. Kitson mentions, the cost in the uh, Warnervale plan 2021 has been indexed to current rates based on the best information available when the plan was prepared back in 2014. Council is preparing a revised Porters Creek wetland plan and once adopted by Council, the Warnervale District Contributions Plan will be reviewed and updated if required. Now, thirdly, in terms of um, existing deeds of agreements, um, in terms of floodplain parcels of land, the costs in the plan are correct and based on the deed of agreement, which is in place, is still in place with the landowners uh, to this day. In terms of the pooling of funds, the Warnervale 2014 plan included 41 drainage subcatchments, 15 transport subcatchments, and seven subcatchments for community facilities, open space, and administration. The Warnervale 2021 plan simplifies this into five transport catchments and one catchment area for open space, community facilities, and plan administration. While the pooling of funds is allowed through the plan and via ministerial direction, the reduction of subcatchments allows funds to be collected more broadly for each category and works prioritised and delivered with surrounding development. Having separate subcatchments complicates the process as contributions are collected for specific projects in each specific catchment area. Not dissimilar to the fact that we've got 53 uh, contributions plans in place, which, which makes it uh, an absolute nightmare for developers or, or people trying to use the plans. And the next phase following this review of this plan is to uh, look at repealing a number of those existing contributions plans, which will come to council next month. And lastly, um, there is the talk about the risk of mixing uh, three different types of catchments together. The Warnervale as I said before, the Warnervale 2014 plan was unnecessarily complex with multiple subcatchments, making the plan difficult to administer and also difficulty for the community and developers to calculate the required local infrastructure contributions. The Warnervale 21 plan has reduced the administrative burden on staff by combining the catchments in the plan, simplifying in the way contributions are levied and allow for easier tracking of income, expenditure and development approvals. So I take it from that uh, you are confident that um, there are no concerns that uh, being raised by Mr Kitson that um, we need to be aware of at this point in time. It sounds to me that I think time has moved on from 2014. There's been a number of changes and clearly we do want to simplify contribution plans. That's something that uh, I have to say in my previous roles we've, uh, I've seen as a must do to simplify the number of contribution plans to be able to give maximum flexibility. That, that's correct, Mr. Administrator. The staff identified a number of the planning assumptions and, and, and social planning projections were incorrect in the, the previous plan and also to a number of errors and 
they've gone through the due diligence process of, uh, of, of getting uh, qualified professionals such as quantity surveyors to review the plan and, and they've gone through the plan line by line in terms of those infrastructure projects to remove those that are state government uh, responsibilities and to look at the costs of those that uh, we need to deliver for the local community. And as I've said before, the, the next phase of, of reviewing this plan will be uh, looking at the uh, the Porters Creek wetland review yeah. and, and see how what changes it can be made to, uh, to, to to get more beneficial environmental outcomes for the for the Warner Vale area. No, that's good. Look, I'm, I'm, I feel comfortable with that. So do you want to just give the community just a little bit of a brief explanation just to check what the plan means, what you've actually done? Sure, Mr. Administrator. Uh, in terms of the, the context of the, the Warnervale Contributions Plan, the planning of Greater Warnervale is being undertaken by the Council to guide future sustainable development. Greater Warnervale is an extensive area of 3,900 hectares that covers the suburbs of Warnervale, Wadalba, Hamlin Terrace, Wingara, Wallara, Wallara and Halloran, together with sections of Wyong, Camwell, Wyonga, Tuggerwong, Tacoma, Charmhaven and Philby. So basically it's our biggest plan and uh, it, it carries the most amount of uh, uh, infrastructure projects to be delivered for the growing Greenfield community of Warnervale. The Central Coast Regional Plan that includes Warnervale as a new strategic centre which along with Wyong and Tugra make up the Northern Growth Corridor, a priority location for service and business growth. Council is working on the preparation of two key documents as, uh, along with this uh, contributions plan, which are the Greater Warnervale Structure Plan and a Master Plan for Warnervale Airport. Once complete, these documents will set the future direction for community, employment, residential and environmental uses of the Greater Warnervale area. Growth in the Greater Warnervale area will be the highest on the Central Coast. By 2036, there will be an additional 36,200 people, 11,900 new dwellings and 8,500 additional jobs. The Warnervale District Contributions Plan 2021 has been prepared to ensure the community infrastructure required to support this population growth can be funded and delivered where it's needed. The Warnervale District Contributions Plan has been reviewed Key changes include simplifying the way contributions are calculated and levied, review of infrastructure and land costs, removal of state funded road infrastructure, which I've mentioned before, to the, to the sum of $88 million, inclusion of additional infrastructure for Wadalba South to support the most recent um, Wadalba landowners, the, the Wadalba East um, rezoning that went through council. Overall reduction in contributions rates across the plan um, have been achieved. And slide five, the Warner Vale District Contributions Plan includes $365 million worth of infrastructure. So it's by and far the largest contributions plan we have. Local, and these include local transport network requirements, drainage works, stormwater quality treatment works, parks and playing fields, community facilities, environmental corridor land and works, and Precinct 7A floodplain restoration works. Of this, approximately 39% of the projects in the plan have been completed. And as I've mentioned before, the plan is 92% fully funded by this plan itself, with the 8% of funding for community facilities to come from funding sources such as grants and other contributions plans. In terms of community consultation, the Warnervale District Contributions Plan 2021 was exhibited twice, firstly in no, between November and December 2020, uh, and following consideration of the submissions re received, uh, some amendments were made to the plan, and the plan was further exhibited in May and June of this year. Uh, 15 submissions were received in total, including one internal submission on open space. Some key changes to the plan include updating of stormwater and drainage infrastructure, amendments to the plan to provide clarity in levying of transport contributions, amendments to open space to include revised costs for district open space facilities at Jensen Road, Wadalba, as well as a review of small parks to ensure consistency with Council's adopted place race strategy. Minor administrative changes in the contributions plan and technical document were also made. 
So the Warner Vale Contribution Plan 2021 is recommended for adoption tonight, Mr. Administrator. Yes, I spent some time reading paper because it's clearly, you know, probably the most important, as you say, and certainly the largest uh, contributions plan that the council's got. And uh, the fact that it's actually covering nearly 12,000 uh, new dwellings and population of 32 and uh, thousand and uh, looking to um, place eight and a half thousand of jobs there. It's certainly, a, you know, it's a massive contributor to the future of uh, Central Coast. So I'm pleased that the work's being done. I think it's important that we do send uh, good, clear signals out there. Um, and the fact that we've been able to consolidate a lot of it and reduce the, li the unfunded liabilities down to just the recreation centre, I think is a good effort. So providing the state takes over the, uh, the, the, the big projects, then um, it looks good. So with that, I'm going to uh, resolve to adopt the resolutions that are shown on the screen and pass those as a decision of council. Item 2.5 which is the draft Central Coast Tennis Facilities Action Plan. Um, I believe that Julie Horn is going to just say a few comments about this. This is to go out for exhibition, so I would expect that there'll be some comments from it, but um, uh, it should be, you know, hopefully well received. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. Um, yeah. Yes, there are 126 public tennis courts located at 34 tennis centres across our local government area. So this strategy has multiple objectives, um, including increasing community awareness of and participation in tennis, identifying and responding to key drivers, challenges and opportunities for tennis on the Central Coast, improving facility management and governance frameworks, developing, implementing and monitoring performance-based occupancy agreements, implementing the identified facility hierarchy and associated asset management regime, and engaging and collaborating with our key partners in the strategy delivery. In developing the strategy, Council and Tennis New South Wales staff have met with tennis facility managers over the last two years to seek input into decision-making around management models. Whilst the engagement has revealed that tennis participation is stable on the Central Coast, there's certainly room for a range of facility improvements such as lighting and online bookings that will value add to service levels currently on offer. A 12-year renewal program has been developed to sustainably manage the life cycle of tennis facilities and provide a long-term strategy for repair, replacement and facility upgrade that will form part of Council's annual Capital Works program. This is informed by operational inspections, independent condition and compliance audits. The draft strategy will inform both the short and long-term projects in Council's Capital Works program within budgeted projects and will assist us in securing additional funding through Tennis Australia and state government programs for renewal upgrades um, of any new tennis facilities. It's intended to place the um, strategy or the action plan on exhibition for 28 days to provide the opportunity to seek community feedback. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. Yes, thank you. It, uh, I hadn't actually been aware, I must confess, of the uh, value of tennis and the number of uh, facilities that there are on the Central Coast is quite amazing. So I'm sure the tennis community will uh, respond well to the, um, to the uh, action plan that's going out. So with that, um, I will adopt the resolutions that are for the draft Central Coast Tennis Facilities Action Plan and uh, resolve those as shown on the screen. We'll move to item 2.6, which is the facility fee relief due to COVID restrictions. And we have our last speaker, Ms. Diane Dales there, um, who is, wishes to speak and um, she's available. We can take her now. Ms. Dale's available. Doesn't look like it. I'm here. Oh, you are. Good. Excellent. Um, 
We couldn't hear you. But <laughs> no. Well, welcome. We haven't started your clock yet. Don't worry. Uh -huh. no, it's all right. And uh, so the rules are three minutes, and um, I'll give you a little bit of time to log off this and then log back into the council meeting to be able to see responses uh, that might be made to the points that you raise. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Hart. My name is Diane Dowes. I'm Secretary Treasurer of the Central Coast Sports Council. You and council staff have received requests from Sports Council and our members for a 50% discount in seasonal hire fees for competition and training. Additionally, Sports Council is asking for a refund for members for any scheduled training event unable to proceed as documented by codes to the 26th of June, 2021. If a facility cannot be used, why should a fee be paid for such a facility? Most players and rate payers, most players are rate payers and the maintenance of community facilities is also included in their council rates. Over the years, council has been placing more and more responsibilities on associations and clubs regarding maintenance of sporting fit grounds. This year, like last year, basically half the winter season was lost due to COVID pandemic and associated lockdowns. In response to recommendation one, we offer the following comments. Not all associations include ground fees in their affiliation fees to clubs. Sports Council knows only of a few codes that do include ground fees. All other codes bill their clubs separately for ground fees. Council invoices association for ground fees and it is the responsibility of the associations to invoice clubs and make payments to Council. In, fin in fact, council won't accept payment directly from clubs where an association exists on the central coast. Council will require any group that hires any community facility to have public liability insurance. This can be the highest expenditure in their budget and is not refundable. Clubs are in such a dire straits they are asking for refunds on as many of these costs as possible. And we all and we need parties to come all parties to come to the table. All cost except ground fees are expended prior to the commencement of the season. The affiliation fees clubs receive from their members does not cover ground fees charged by council. Clubs utilize money raised through county in sales, fundraisers, sponsorship and revenue from final streets to pay ground fees. Raising including sponsorship, this winter and last winter has been nearly non-existent and clubs are barely keeping their heads above water. Most sporting bodies on the coast have lost a huge amount financially and this year as well as last year due to lockdowns. Some associations have paid their clubs referee and umpire costs to help clubs where their players who have lost hours of work or their job and the clubs need this income. Clubs have lost all their final series revenue profit along with revenue of canteens during the normal competition rounds. We believe our request for a 50% discount in seasonal higher fees for competition and training, plus a refund for any scheduled training event unable to proceed is a reasonable request. We we were here earlier this year here looking for reduction, reduction in these fees, which was, which was denied. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask to actually just, just respond to some, of the, some of the questions you raised, I understand them, and certainly, uh, and I do appreciate the extremely difficult position that a lot of sporting clubs and a lot of community organisations of all shape, size, and colour uh, have uh, have suffered throughout this period. Um, but I'll, I'll let uh, Ms. Vaughan just uh, try to respond to some of those points you raised. Thank you, Mr. Administrator, and thanks, Ms. Dales, for um, coming along this evening. And as you've quite like, rightly um, stated, um, both the Sports Council and a number of other sporting organisations have written to myself and um, I understand other members of um, the organisation to raise their concerns. So I am pleased to advise that the intention of the Council's report this evening and recommendation one is that we do believe that that will result in a, um, up to a 50% fee relief for sporting associations. That is reflective of how much of the season that has been lost as a result of COVID. Um, however, in relation to refunding of scheduled training events, um, I can also advise this evening as has been provided in correspondence that 
um, Council already takes into consideration potential impacts on training events due to weather or other um, unforeseen circumstances, and that's included um, at the time of setting our annual fees. So we consider um, loss of usage due to weather conditions, and that equates to um, uh, four weeks per season that we make allowance for. So based on that, um, we have not considered, we consider that um, the fee structure already takes that into consideration. So therefore any further subsidy for trainings has not been included um, into this evening's um, council report. Thank you. Do you wish to make any other comments on the paper, Spoon? Uh, yes, please, Mr. Administrator. Um, just to um, note, obviously, COVID has had an impact. And as I've stated, that uh, a number of sporting associations and community organisations have made representation to us um, as the vast um, bulk of the season for sporting um, organisations was um, impacted. Um, we were hopeful that um, that we may have been able to um, realise some um, alternate season, but when lockdown was extended, that um, opportunity was taken away. And whilst um, Council currently only um, recovers approximately 8% of the costs of us providing sports facilities, we are also very conscious of the impact that this has had on sports associations and why we're proposing that, um, up to, uh, that a 50% refund of um, Council sports usage fees be returned to clubs and associations that they can show where they're also offering um, support to players. In relation to community facilities, uh, we, we operate and manage um, and provide leases and licenses to a range of groups ranging from surf clubs, sport and recreation facilities, community centres, senior centres and youth centres, over 300 in total. Um, and that although there's already provision within our council leasing and licensing policy to support community organisations, again, we've received significant representation from those um, groups to either ask for rental assistance or pausing of rental fees. So the report details that the request for rental assistance will be assessed on a financial hardship assessment basis with documentation um, needed to be provided by organisations to evidence the impact of COVID decline um, in revenue, lack of financial capacity to cover rental fees, etc. So um, with that, um, Mr. Administrator, the report provides recommendations um, detailing the level of fee relief to be provided to both sporting organisations and community facilities. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bourne. Look, um, it is a difficult one. This, I mean, uh, COVID has wrecked a lot of things um, and played havoc uh, with a lot of entities and uh, particularly community organisations and voluntary organisations. So it is a very, very difficult one when, particularly when the season sort of gets, the winter season gets stopped literally halfway through it, um, through the uh, COVID uh, lockdown rules. Uh, I'm also very mindful of the fact that the organisation is not in a strong financial position um, and uh, we, you know, we're probably not in a position that other councils are in where they could offer perhaps a greater sense of, uh, of relief. So I think we've got to adopt something that is fair and reasonable um, in here, which I believe uh, we have done. My understanding is that basically it's sort of going to be approached on an individual basis for individual groups and it's... Uh, you know, if people can prove particular hardship, then they will have that opportunity to get more assistance. But, uh, you know, they've got to go through that process. And it's not too different from the way the Commonwealth uh, and the state are uh, uh, managing their payments out to businesses and so on that, um, you know, to support staff, etc. So we organisations will have to prove their, uh, their case. And I think that's only fair and reasonable, given that uh, on the other side of the coin, we just don't have a a large pot of money that we can just uh, gaily refund and give back. So on balance, I'm comfortable with the approach the council's proposing here, uh, and therefore I will propose to move the recommendations and resolve and adopt the resolutions as shown on the screen. Now we move to item 2.7, which is the public exhibition of the Central Coast Green Grid Plan. This is actually something that's quite nice. Um, so hopefully a short presentation from uh, uh, the director responsible, which is Mr. Scott Fox. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. I'll, I'll try to get through, through, through this as quickly as I can. So basically what the green grid, the Central Coast Green Grid is, it's a, uh, it's a 
in essence, a placemaking tool that, that brings together a, a, a lot of different features um, such as urban ecosystems, biodiversity, resilience, urban amenity, but more importantly, some connect connectivity between public spaces for the benefit of the Central Coast community. Often projects may get done um, in isolation without considering other features of the landscape that can be uh, considered as part of a project um, so you can, you can get more bang for your buck and also get greater placemaking outcomes, um, particularly when you're considering connectivity between different public spaces. So the plans are first of its kind for regional areas of New South Wales uh, and also aligns with the New South Wales Premier's priority of uh, great public spaces. Um, so the Central Coast Green Plan interacts with a number of New South Wales government legislative instruments as well as some of the principal planning documents for the Central Coast. These include the Community Strategic Plan, the Local Strategic Planning Statement, the Central Coast Regional Plan, and more recently, the Central Coast Greener Places Strategy. So the aims of the Green Grid are guided by six overarching aims. The create, and these include creating quality green spaces close to homes, protecting and managing environmentally important lands, and increasing the tree canopy to improve livability across the Central Coast, um, as one of its key um, successes in terms of integrating and implementing uh, a number of projects. So the, the green grid is comprises of six grids consisting of a hydrological grid, an ecological grid, agricultural grid, cultural grid, recreational, and more imp and, and importantly, transport and public domain, which is the connectivity grid. The analysis of the current grids was supported by a series of technical studies as well. In order to use the, the grid, a project ranking criteria has been developed to determine the benefit of an individual project against each of the six grids I've just mentioned. Represented as a table within the document, the project ranking poses a number of questions under each of the grids. A project is given a score of zero, which means unlikely, one partially, and two fully meets the criteria. And it's an effective way of prioritising projects and influencing council's future works programs. So lastly, I'd just like to introduce the plan to the community. Uh, and the recommendation for tonight is that uh, for the, is to place on public exhibition for the purposes of community consultation. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm sure that the community are actually going to receive this well because it's, it's, it's a, I guess it's almost one of the missing pieces, isn't it, to make sure that the whole grid, the whole linking together of everything is planned instead of being in isolation. So I certainly you know, congratulate you on the, on the, uh, the idea and the process and I look forward to seeing what the community's views of it. So that We'll move to put it out on, on exhibition then. So uh, I will now resolve to adopt the resolutions as shown on the screen. And we move to item 2.8, which is the Governance Lighthouse Report as at 30th of June, 2021. Now this, this report is in fact, uh, you know, a report that's produced on a regular basis. Uh, there is very little change from the last report. So with that, I just, Proposed to move the move the the resolution that's shown on the screen now and adopt that as a decision as council. Item two point nine, which is the unreasonable payment conduct policy. Uh, that's I've had a good read through that because clearly, um, unfortunately, I think with social media and so on, times have changed a little bit, and such staff uh, and other people certainly now come under a great deal more abuse than they may have previously in the past. So the changes to this policy have just been to update it to make it, I think, a more modern, um, more modern document. Um, the change of names is, is so on, sort of which are very minor changes. But I guess the main change in there is the fact now that it, it has to be possible for where there's you know, particular persistence and unreasonable 
and nasty behaviour, whether it's online or in coming into the reception areas and so on. But we do have the ability to now report that to the police and make sure that the staff are protected. So uh, with those changes that are in there, I'm very happy to uh, adopt the resolution uh, to the changes to the unreasonable contact complaint and conduct policy and uh, move those as a decision of council. Item 2.10, which is the complaints and feedback management policy. Now, this is a policy that is actually going to go out for consultation. Um, again, there's very few changes to it. It's uh, pre predominantly some name changes and some minor amendments. So uh, I'm quite happy that, that that just gets passed now and goes out for consultation, and we'll see it back uh, after the community have had an opportunity to comment on it. So with that, uh, I resolve to adopt the resolutions for item 2.10 as shown on the screen. Item 2.11 is activities of the Development Assessment Unit, January to June period. Again, this is a, step, a standard report. So Mr. Scott, can you take us through this? Uh, it's not all good news, I know. Um, but I think we have to face up to the fact that uh, with the changes that we've had to make to the organisations, there was always going to be a slight drop in service. And this is just an example of that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Administrator. Um, as I've mentioned before, the um the importance of the construction industry and therefore the, the DA assessment process um, is key for the economy of the Central Coast. So that's why we report on a, on a regular basis the, uh, the activities of, of the development assessment unit. And the, the following provides a snapshot of figures for the, for the past six months from January to June. A total of just over 1,600 development applications were lodged, which is a slight increase on the previous year of 1,562 applications lodged. And it is slightly up again on applications lodged for the same period last year. Uh, during January to June of 2021, a total of 1,437 development applications were determined. And this is an increase of 1,351 determined for the same period of last year. And I just point out that that, that total uh, uh, being more than, than the same period of last year was done with less staff, whilst the, 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 the assessment times have increased. Um, uh, and, and, and a major player with that was focusing on a lot of the older development application. The actual output is greater with less staff than, than the same period for last year. Of the 1,437 applications determined in the January to June 21 period, 1,422 were determined under staff delegation, and 15, determined what, uh, 15 were determined by another regulatory body, such as the Regional Planning Panel or the Central Coast Local Planning Panel. So in terms of the dollar figures, for a development assessment, the estimated value of applications determined in the January to June 21 period was approximately $417 million, with approximately $1.1 billion in determinations for the entire 2021 financial year. And this is a slight increase on the 2019-20, the where the value of determinations was slightly less than $1 billion. Uh, of these uh, approvals, uh, there were 633 new individual dwellings approved uh, in the period of Jan January to June 21. The total number of development applications outstanding at this period was 694, which is an increase of 581 outstanding applications at the end of December and considerable increase from the 506 outstanding uh, at the same time of June 2020. In terms of processing times uh, for development applications, uh, the, the time frame was 77 days for this period. Uh, that is a gross figure. Um, and this is a slight increase on the 71 days from the July to December period and from 58 day average assessment time for the last quarter of 2019-20. There's been a distinct slowing in determination time frames throughout 2021. This is evident in the increase of mean and median processing times for the reporting period compared to the previous six months from July to December. 
and a significant increase in the processing times compared to the final quarter of 2019-20. Uh, um, th th this is, a, as I said before, a result of a number of factors, such as the reduction in the number of development building assessment staff, um, a total of 10. There's also been an increase in the number of development applications lodged. And as I said before, there has been a greater focus on those older applications, reducing those older than 12 months from 44 down to less than 12 um, at this period of time. Uh, also, too, I just go to the slide that just shows some of the trends. Uh, it may be a little bit hard to see for some people, but it's in the report as well. So, so we can get a, a better understanding of tracking of the development applications and some trends. Uh, we, we've put this, this graph together, which shows the total outstanding uh, development applications over the past three years, as well as the determination times uh, and, and the amount of applications lodged and determined uh, for, the, for the various periods. In terms of uh, building efficiencies, which, which the, the administrator mentioned earlier on in the night, as part of the realignment of services, opportunities for efficiencies are being sought, including mechanisms to assist in establishing appropriate levels of service, including assessment times for the community. And this includes consolidation of systems and policies, uh, such as the property and rating system. Also, too, the Central Coast Consolidated LEP was adopted by Council uh, earlier this, uh, late last year, and it's waiting gazettal from the state government. And that will provide significant efficiencies in having staff uh, working from the same planning one single set of planning documents as opposed to multiple planning documents. Uh, and also too, at the last council meeting, council adopted uh, the policy for development assessment functions. Uh, the 2021 operational plan also has a target of 49 day processing times and staff will strive to achieve that target. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cox. Look, it's great to hear there is some productivity there as well. I think that's a you know, it's one of the things that we haven't probably been as good as we could have been in telling the community that we are making productivity gains, um, you know, as well as having saved uh, you know, some extensive costs over the over the period. So, look, I'm pleased to sort of uh, adopt that uh, report and uh, adopt the resolution that is shown on the screen as a decision of council. And now we come to the last item, which is item 2.12, which is the end of term report for 2018 through to 2018-19 through the 2021 year, which is supposed to be the period for the, which the councils have been in place. Uh, so it's slightly irrelevant because uh, we don't have a council in place at the moment. But I think it was still very good practice to actually produce, you know, just an assessment of what has happened over the previous uh, term of the, of, the current, of the council that was in place previously. Mr. Cox, just want to make a few comments on some of the good things. Um, obviously, we finish off with something that wasn't quite so good. <laughs> process. But uh, as so, someone pointed out, as uh, I think the CFO pointed out earlier, um, a lot of the, the money that uh, was unlawfully used did not go into anybody's back pocket. It actually went into things, into infrastructure and so on. So... It was a very expensive credit card, but nonetheless, uh, the money did get spent on uh, infrastructure as, and as the previous administrator and I have attested to, we, have, we do not believe there was any fraud or corruption. Or, in other words, no money going into back pockets. Uh, it did all go into infrastructure and so on, albeit it was probably spending well beyond what they were earning. So would you like to just highlight some of the key things that have happened over the, the last term? Sure, Mr. Administrator, and, and the report identifies that that there have been a number of challenges over the, you know, particularly the last twelve months. But but there are some 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 highlights that um, the end of term report um, identifies. So basically, this is the Central Coast Council's first end of term report, and it covers the period since the community strategic plan was adopted in twenty eighteen to now. It details. Achievements Council has made in implementing the Community Strategic Plan and progress against any indicators listed in the, in the Community Strategic Plan. 
It also includes challenges and identifies areas where we need to improve and focus on. Making it useful when it comes to council developing the new three-year delivery program, Nothing, noting one of the biggest challenges moving forward is ensuring the fiscal sustainability of the council. So a little bit of the background, the end of term report forms as part of the monitor aspect of the CSP, the Community Strategic Plan and the Delivery Program. It is important to note that this does not replace the annual report and an annual report for 2021 financial year will still be prepared and published by late November 2021. Council's achievements in implementing the Community Strategic Plan include various infrastructure projects like the Central Coast Regional Sporting and Recreation Complex at Cugra, Adcock Park at West Gosford, and more recently, the Terrigal Boardwalk. Cultural, community and sporting events like Harvest Festival, Love Lanes Festival, and the Lakes Festival. Development, adoption, and implementation of key strategic planning documents, such as the Disability Inclusion Action Plan, the Biodiversity Strategy, and the Tourism Opportunity Plan. There's also been considerable progress made towards achieving one planning instrument for the Central Coast with the Consolidated Local Environment Plan now lodged with the Department of Planning and awaiting Gazette. As well as achievements, some notable challenges included Council's current financial situation and the ongoing impacts to become financially stable, the COVID-19 pandemic, and a number of extreme weather events resulting in floods, drought, fire, and coastal erosion. In terms of progress against the community strategic plan indicators, there's a lot to celebrate, including the sense of community on the Central Coast and feel safe in neighbourhoods and public places, a decrease in break and enter offences, the percentage of residents participating in 150 minutes or more of moderate or vigorous exercise, the number of residents investing in renewable energy and diversion of waste not going to landfill. Equally, there are a number of areas where we need to focus on including reducing domestic violence behaviour with the trend of offences continuing to increase, decreasing the number of youth who are unemployed or disengaged with the need for more employment or education opportunities for those aged 15 to 24, improving the community's confidence in council, particularly since the financial crisis and ongoing impacts, and decreasing the number of residents experiencing psychological distress. This is particularly of concern given the COVID-19 pandemic and the added stresses it can cause. The end of term report is recommended to you, Mr. Administrator, for adoption. Well, I think it is a comprehensive, and I think it was very important to record uh, for the previous council uh, some of the good things that were done, um, and that there undoubtedly were a lot of good things done. As, a, as, a, as the report says, and I say in my introduction to it, it's just unfortunate that uh, at the end of the period, um, it, we had the crisis come upon us, but nonetheless, there has been some good work done, and uh, I congratulate the council for doing uh, a lot of those projects, albeit a little bit suspect where the funding came from. But anyway, all that is good news. And with that, uh, I will pass the recommendation that is shown on the screen and make that as a decision at council. And with that, that concludes the council meeting for the Tuesday, the 28th of September. And uh, we conclude it at 8.38 p.m.